There was a little riff a week or two when Stephen Hawking was in Washington, D.C. And I talked about trying to hop a train to Washington, D.C. so I could get Stephen Hawking's brain. Because they would be delicious. Hawking, so not at. Wow. Time to start. The we're starting a little late tonight, uh, which is why I'm not as surprised as normal. Because normally I'm just sitting here and we're in conversation. And you just missed it. We were having this great conversation here in studio about Sunnyvale and how Sunnyvale sucks. <laughs> and I can say that because Sunnyvale has an access TV station, but we're not on it. So no one there is going to see me say that Sunnyvale sucks. Uh, someone here tried to do a documentary on Sunnyvale and was forced to give up because nothing interesting had ever happened in Sunnyvale. Uh, they'd, they'd gotten a big government grant. They were like, yeah, we're going to get $7 million if we can do a documentary on something interesting in Sunnyvale, and they had to give the money back. Uh, I believe it went to study penguins or something like that. You know, something outrageous, penguins and dry cleaning because nothing interesting had ever happened in Sunnyvale. I live on the very, very edge of Sunnyvale, which is if I were standing on my house and I threw a rock west, the rock would land in Sunnyvale if I had a, a good arm. I mean, I don't, and generally there's a house in the way. So if I throw a rock west, the guy across the street from me comes by and goes, you broke my window throwing a rock at my house. Or more likely, he went, you threw a rock at my window and it didn't break, but it did wake up my children. Please don't throw rocks at Sunnyvale from your driveway because you're not going to hit Sunnyvale and you're just going to wake the kids up. And I'd be like, I'm sorry. I wasn't intending to wake your children. I, I wanted to throw a rock and hit Sunnyvale because I hate Sunnyvale. Although I don't hate Sunnyvale. I'm kind of ambivalent. I drive through Sunnyvale and I got a ticket from a Sunnyvale cop once. So I kind of hate Sunnyvale. <laughs> But I also got a, a ticket from a Cupertino cop, and I, I guess he was a sheriff, so I really hate the, the county sheriffs. And I, I don't want to go into it, because it makes... Okay, so here's the thing. So you're driving to work on your own in your car, and then you look in your rearview mirror, and there's lights, wee, 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 and the cop pulls you over. And first of all, you're in front of a school, and there's a big fire zone. So you drive past the big red fire zone, and then you pull over, and he's like, you should have pulled over when I kept behind you. And I'm like... I wasn't going to stop in the fire zone. He's like, you should have stopped. And I'm like, what? What if there was a fire? <laughs> like, would the cops go, that's okay. The, the, the fire truck can wait. We're giving this guy a ticket for running a stop sign, which he didn't run. Because I stopped, and the cop's like, you didn't stop. The sheriff's like, you didn't stop. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I stopped. And he's like, I saw you. And I'm like, did you tape me? He's like, no, we don't do that. I'm like, well, now what am I going to do? I'm going to go to court, and you're going to go, he didn't stop. And I'm going to go, I think I did. <laughs> and then the judge is going to go, well, you owe this much money because he says you didn't stop. And I'd be like, I did stop. And he's like, well, you're biased. <laughs> like, isn't he biased? He's like, no, he's a cop. And I'm like, he could still be biased. <laughs> I, just, I just went to freaking traffic school on the Internet. I typed all my little questions in, and, and I got a good score. And then in Santa Clara County, after you go to traffic school online, you have to go to traffic school in person and take a little test to prove you went to traffic school online, which never made a lot of sense to me. And then I aced that test. And then I talked to the guy afterward, and he's like, yeah, we get a bunch of money for running traffic school. And I'm like, well, I know. I paid it. And he's like... <laughs> How many people don't pass? He's like, almost everyone passes. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, a lot of them really rush through the online thing. And I'm like, you can't rush through it. It won't let you go too fast. And he's like, oh, people do other stuff. And I'm like, I knew I should have been doing other stuff. <laughs> anyway, welcome to Keith Explains tonight. Uh, tonight, first topic, I'm going to, here you go. See, freeze. People with good TVs could freeze frame that and then you could just turn off the TV and go see something else because now you know what I'm going to talk about, except I didn't show you that one. There we go. See? That side's blank. See, page one, page two, page three. Nothing. I ran out of ideas. <laughs> Actually, I didn't run out of ideas. I just stopped writing because I went, there's no way in heck I'm going to get to the last item here, which is origami. <laughs> 
Just you wait and see. If I'm <laughs> if I end up talking about origami, uh, I will tear this piece of paper in half and eat the blank part. After you fold. I'm not going to eat the red part because, well, first of all, it's got words on it that I might need, and secondly, I have no confidence that they didn't put poison in the red ink in these cheap pens I buy because they're probably from China. I wonder if they say made in. Nope. I'm never going to know. Anyway, topic one. This has been a big topic on the discussion boards. People have written in many times. Keith, can you explain health care reform? <laughs> and I can, but that's how I know there's no way I'm getting to origami because it's going to be very long to explain health care reform or health insurance reform or whatever the heck you want to call it. Uh, topic one, people said, hey, what's this public option I keep hearing about? Isn't that like nationalizing health care? And I'm like, no, the two have nothing to do with each other. Uh, here's the thing. So in America, people have insurance generally because they have a job and their, insur their employer gives them insurance or because they're married to someone that has a job whose employer gave them insurance or because they're 14 and their dad has a job and his employer <laughs> gives him insurance. Do you, do you see the common thread there? It's all... People get insurance because they have a job, and the guy that gave them the job is paying for the insurance. And that all works well if everyone has a job, but not everyone does, and it's getting less and less so every day, and that <laughs> causes a lot of problems in the world. Um, number one, people without jobs don't have insurance, but people without jobs can still get sick or get hit by buses. <laughs> Heck, they might be more likely to get hit by buses because they're out during the day, because they don't have a job. <laughs> so getting insurance because you have a job doesn't work terribly well. No one else in the world really gets insurance because they have a job. Uh, I suppose the most extreme example is Somalia, where no one has a job <laughs> and no one has insurance. It's a libertarian paradise, really. Oh, yeah. uh, so leaving that aside uh, nowhere in the western world really is stuck with this you have a job therefore you have insurance thing there are other problems like the fact that your employer gives you insurance means that you don't actually know what your insurance costs and your employer has this huge benefit to you know screwing you as much as possible by giving you as little insurance as possible while you think you're getting a lot of insurance and you're it doesn't work that great, which is why most companies don't do it. So anyway, so the public option. That's how I got on this topic. The idea behind, now, now the reason you get insurance from your employer is because hopefully your employer has a bunch of people there. And when you have a bunch of people, odds are most of them aren't going to get brain cancer. And since brain cancer is ungodly expensive to fix, the fact that most of them don't get brain cancer means a lot of them pay into insurance and don't need to get a lot of money paid out for them. You get these, you get a large pool of people and they all put some money into insurance and in general at the end you have enough money left in the pool to pay for the couple people that are really expensive. Uh, if you were trying to buy insurance on your own, you'd go to an insurer and go, I'd like insurance. And they'd go, do you have brain cancer? And you'd go, no, I don't. And they're like, how do you know? And you'd go, I don't know how I'd know if I had insurance so I could see a doctor and he could tell me. And then they'd be like, we're not going to give you insurance because you might have brain cancer. And that's ungodly expensive to fix. And so just go away. And then you have to go get a job. And then your employer would go, do you have brain cancer in the interview? And you go, I don't think so. And they'd go, well, it's okay. We can't not hire you if you have brain cancer anyway, so never mind. Uh, can you be here Monday at 9? And it'd be like, if I don't have brain cancer, I'll be here Monday at 9. If I'm not here Monday at 9, send someone by the house to see if I've fallen and died. Uh, and then you show up and they give you insurance and, and everything seems to be okay. Up until you do get brain cancer. And then you go to the hospital and they're like, "We're you're like, I'm here for the brain cancer thing. And they're like, door 7. And you go to door 7 and they put you in a bed, and then right before they're ready to take the brain cancer out of you, your insurance company will call the hospital and go, yeah, we were checking into things, and it turns out you had a bunion. Back in 1974, you forgot to mention, so we're not going to pay for the brain cancer, because there's 
anecdotal evidence that bunions lead to brain cancer. Many people who get brain cancer also have previously gotten bunions. We don't know if there's a cause and effect, but correlation is enough for us and we have decided that you don't get insurance even though you now have brain cancer and need it. Um, it's kind of funny, the people that insurance companies want to take the insurance away from are the people, it turns out, who need the insurance. Uh, I, I spent most of my life living a very healthy existence, and my insurer was happy to take my money. And then when I broke my leg, I discovered if I hadn't called them within 36 hours of entering the hospital, they wouldn't have paid for a darn thing. Now, luckily, I did call them within 36 hours of entering the hospital, but that's only because I had remembered to bring my insurance card, and on the back it said, must call in within 36 hours of major hospitalization. If I had forgotten my card, I think I would have owed like $24,000 for, for fixing the leg. Anyway, public, see, I keep forgetting to get into public options. So here's, so what a public option is, is the theory is the government is going to set up a very large pool of people namely anyone that wants to buy insurance from the government. And then the government will figure, well, if we charge everyone $300 a month, $400 if you have kids, uh, $900 if you're that duggard family in Alabama that has 20 kids. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? Hey, never mind. Uh, $300, bucks, $400 if you have kids. If we collect this from everyone, odds are we'll have enough money to pay pay for all the people that actually have accidents and get sick and stuff. And if they don't collect enough money, they'll collect more the next year. And if they collect too much, they'll lower rates. It's kind of like what insurance companies are supposed to do now, except when an insurance company collects too little money, they raise rates. And when they collect too much money, they give the excess to the executives. <laughs> so the net result right now is insurance never goes down because there's never any extra money. Uh, so that's a public option. Uh, it has nothing to do with the nationalized health care, which is like what Britain has. In Britain, they have given up on the concept of doctors being self-employed or of hospitals or whatever. In Britain, just if you're a doctor, you work for the government. It's like you get a little card, you know, I am a civil servant. And you just work for the government, they pay you a salary, and if someone gets sick, you, well, you know, you're putting in your 40 hours a week, and the person comes in and sees you, and then you treat them, and then you send them away, and then the next guy comes in. Uh, doctors in Britain, I don't know how much money they make. Maybe they make more than here, maybe they make less than here, but they probably do get a cool British pension. And they get to say to themselves, I work for the same government that 007 works for. And therefore, <laughs> I am peripherally cool because he is a colleague of mine. <laughs> Whereas here in America, <coughs> our spies and our doctors work in totally different organizations. There's no, there's little crossover between our spies, and America doesn't really have cool spies anyway. We tried with that triple X guy, and we saw how those movies went. <laughs> Not well. Uh, similar to public option. So Britain is nationalized healthcare. Government just pays for all the doctors. Um, the current plan is to keep the current system in America set up a public option where there's a big insurance pool that the government runs that you can buy into. And if you want to keep your current insurance, you keep your current insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of other stuff about how we're going to electrically make medical records. And uh, we're going to set up death panels, which is... Uh, <laughs> here's A lot of people are confused about the death panels because they're like, is the death panel going to kill my grandma? Uh, and the answer is... Probably. <laughs> Although, again, it's going to depend on how Grandma has voted. Because they're, they're going to tie the death panels together with the electronic voting that we have now. If Grandma has been voting for Republicans, Grandma will get routed into the should-be-killed pool. Whereas if Grandma has been voting for the... See, that's... that's that's, of course, how it works, because we know right now we have no death panels. Like, insurance companies do not decide not to pay for things for old people just because they're old, ever. Uh, I'm told that the average old person, when they go to the hospital, gets, you know, a single room with a gold-coated bathtub in it. <laughs> and 
Then they have two nurses, one on the left side, one on the right side. Uh, they call them left nurse, right nurse. Uh, and they're at their beck and call. And anything any old person needs in the hospital, they get without question. Like no one has ever said, now you need to wait seven months for an MRI because we're not sure if you need it right now as the insurance company. No, insurance companies just love to pay for things. That's why they have so much money. You know, they're paying for so much that no one notices that they're skimming it off the top. Anyway, so we have the death panels, which are going to kill all the old people, uh, I think. I'm, I, truthfully, I haven't been paying a lot of attention to exactly what the death panels are supposed to do because I get most of my, my information by watching Glenn Beck, and he's just gotten kind of loopy lately, and I don't quite follow exactly what all the crazy things going on are. Apparently there are death panels and weeping. You're supposed to weep on TV. <laughs> anyway, that's health care reform. Uh, by the time I get the show edited, this whole health care reform thing will be behind us. We'll have totally fixed everything. We'll have moved on to the next big problem in America, which I believe is going to be primetime TV shows. <laughs> Uh, they're not good. I don't know if you've noticed. Back in the old days, we had great series like The Rockford Files, and now we have three men and a baby, or <laughs> two men and a dog. Two and a half men is what I'm thinking of, apparently. See, they, they can't even come up with good names for shows anymore. Two and a half men. The premise is there's like two old guys. And one of them has a little kid, except the show's been on like nine years. And the little kid, I think, is taller than one of the two guys. So it's like nowhere near two and a half men anymore. Unless I'm thinking of a different show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, topic two, biking to work. Uh, as I mentioned last time, I bought a new bike. Uh, and I bought an expensive bike in order to guilt myself into using it. Because if I just bought a regular bike, I'd never bother to actually ride the bike. It would just sit in the garage like my old bike, which I paid $25 for, did. Because I'd be like, eh, 25 bucks, I didn't lose 25 bucks, whatever. But see, this time I went out, paid 800 bucks for a bike, and now if I don't use the bike, I wasted $800. Mm -hmm. Except, of course, you know, so that first day that I got on the bike and I biked to work, it cost me $800 to bike to work. <laughs> well, 400 to bike to work and 400 to bike home, <laughs> right? Because you got to bike both directions. So then the next day I got up and I thought, man, that was an expensive bike. So then I biked to work, right? But now, at the end of day two, it only cost me $200 a day or $400 a day to bike to work, 200 each way, two way, right? So like after a week, I was down to like $80 a day to bike to work. And now it's been like three or four weeks. I biked like, you know, 15, 20 days. I'm like, now it's down to like $30 a day is what it's costing me to bike to work. And every day it costs a little bit less on the average. You know, I'm darn close to the point where I could rent a car <laughs> for what it is costing me to bike to work. Uh, there have been some incidental costs, like I had to go buy a headlight for it. So that bumped up my cost per day of riding the bike to work, uh, but I viewed it as a good investment in case it gets dark all of a sudden <laughs> and all of the street lights go out and I need to see to get home is, and it's, it's not a very bright light, so I hope it doesn't get real dark. Uh, I'll just try to leave before it's dark. Um, so for biking to work, so I get up early in the morning, like 9, 9.30. <laughs> okay, I get up earlier than that, but not a lot because I am an engineer. I don't want to lose engineer cred by getting up early. Uh, and then I put on my clothes and I get on stairs and I get on my bike. And for a while I was just carrying my, my bag over my, over my shoulder and that was not comfortable because it kept tipping me back. So eventually I bought some, some bags for the bike. That cost more money, bumping the price up. But, but now I could put the computer in the bag, and it, it wasn't cutting me off. Uh, the other thing I do is I listen to the iPod on the way into work. Someone just works like, you shouldn't listen to an iPod. You should be able to hear traffic. And I'm like, 
there's no traffic the way I bike to work. I get on a little side street and then a little side street and then a third little side street and then I'm on Homestead Road for two blocks and then it's side streets again. And he's like, there could still be a car. And I'm like, I still, I got to listen to something because I've always got to have information going into my head. <laughs> if there's no information going into my head, that's wasted time. So I get my little phone out and I plug my headphones in and then I put my phone on the NPR app so I can listen to the radio on my phone. <laughs> now, I could just get a radio and listen to the radio on my headphones, but I need to have my phone digitally tune, you know, to a radio station over the internet so I can hear it because I'm too cheap to buy a radio. <laughs> And so the cool thing is I will be biking to work and it will just go out for no reason at all because I have biked through a dead zone. And I even know where these dead zones are. Namely, there's like one along Homestead and there's one on this street near our house. Because in the car, when I'm driving, if I'm on the phone, it'll go out for a couple seconds. Except on my bike, it goes out for like a minute because I'm slow. <laughs> Uh, I have a speedometer that tells me what my speed is, and I, I can pretty reliably do eight miles an hour on my bike. And people are like, couldn't you walk faster than that? I'm like, no, I also walk kind of slow <laughs> compared to the 30 miles an hour I drive. <laughs> but so I'll be on my bike, and suddenly the radio will stop. And then like a minute later, it will pick up again somewhere else, and I have missed a minute of the show. And I every time that happens, I think to myself, you should just go buy a stupid radio. They're like $4. <laughs> and since the radio waves are being broadcast in real time and going through me the whole time I'm on my radio, I'm on my bike, it's probably no worse off than now when I'm using a very expensive phone to emulate a very cheap radio. <laughs> And then I thought, but, but then I couldn't listen to far away radio stations. Like, what if I want to listen to Maine Public Radio on the way into work? I can't tune Maine Public Radio from here. And then I went, but I don't. I always listen to KQED, the local public radio. I don't know why. <sighs> the other thing I have discovered about biking to work is we have hills here. <laughs> never occurred to me there was any elevation here uh, there are of course the hills and the west and, s and east edges of Silicon Valley but I had always kind of assumed that the part I lived on was flat like a pancake <laughs> until I discovered that it's a lot easier to bike home at night than it is to bike in in the morning and for a while I thought that's just because I had gotten up and hadn't had a lot of coffee and was tired and then I thought well but there are parts of the bike ride in the morning that are okay, and there are parts of the bike ride in the morning that aren't okay. And, like, there's this one, like, when I'm close to work, I'm headed down, I don't know the names of any of the streets. I've only lived here 20 years, for God's sakes. <laughs> I'm going to say Bollinger. It's not Bollinger. It's Blaney. It's Blaney. <laughs> and there's this hill over 280 on Blaney that always nearly kills me. But after I have gotten over the hill... I turn towards Apple, and all of a sudden, it is like I have hit molasses. And I'm like, man, is it really hard to go these two and a half blocks to Apple. Until one day, it occurred to me, engineer genius that I am, <laughs> that the problem is that that street basically is at a slight incline the whole way. And so in the morning, I am biking uphill. And at night, I'm biking downhill along the way. I mean, it's... You understand at home, you uphill one way, downhill the other way. But so I, we have hills here, for God's sakes, people. We, we should mention this in school to our kids so that they don't feel stupid. Uh, I have four minutes left, I'm told, so there's no chance of me getting to origami. Look, that whole paper, nothing yet. Um, but I need to mention this. There's a game you can buy for the iPhone. Oh, no. Um, it's, no. I'll, it's called Geodefense. I'm going to quickly show it to you just so that you don't think I'm lying. Okay, it's there. It's one of those icons. I'll, the, the, edit, the, the, the credits guy will put up a better picture of it. Under no circumstances should you buy this game for your iPhone. <laughs> if you buy Geodefense, and I think it costs like $2. 
I mean, everything for the iPhone is cheap. I don't know how they make any money off it. It's like two dollars. You will lose weeks of your life playing this game. Okay? <laughs> you will like play the same stupid level like forty times, thinking if I just put the towers in the right place and get them upgraded on time, I will be able to kill everything before they beat me. And no, no, you will not. Okay? <laughs> you will keep trying. You will be dragging. You will be clicking. You will be punching. You will be frustrated. Okay? And you'll be like, oh, no one could possibly win this. And then you'll be sitting in your office early one morning, minding your own business when an email comes in from a friend of yours that's like, I finally solved all the levels of geodefense. Now I'm just trying to get higher scores on all of them. And then you will curse him. You will curse this man. <laughs> You'd be like, I am going to drive to your house if I knew where it was, and I'm going to beat you up if I knew how. <laughs> but instead, I'm just going to sit here in my office and see, because you sent me screenshots of all the, the levels with the high scores, and the, oh, I'm trying to get above 4 million on level 21, and that, you can't win 21. It's impossible, for God's sakes. You can't put enough lasers, and the little things keep getting... <laughs> geodefense. Don't buy geodefense. Ah, I got like two minutes. I'm not even going to go into home repair. Here we go. Ah, another topic people have asked me. Keith, what's up with the website? Now, I know the website's not the greatest. Um, the problem with the website is I'm in charge, and I'm not good at it. Uh, I was reminded of this recently because, as it turns out, my cat now has a better website than I do. <laughs> My cat, kittyphotographer.com, has a website where there's a new picture pasted every day and it's beautiful and there's things and the cat has a camera and you can see the pictures the cat took every day and my website doesn't change for years at a time <laughs> and has a crappy flash animation on the front page and I don't know what to do. I... <sighs> see, uh, there's zero chance of getting to origami now. Uh, <laughs> Here we go, search optimization offers. Uh, people email me and they say, hey, I would like to optimize your website's placement in search engines. And I write them back and go, have you seen my website? <laughs> and then I'll talk about how, I'm talking about the pills website here. And I will say, as near as I can tell, I am the number one hit for my website most of the time. Anyway. Next time, everyone, we'll talk about some of these other topics. Maybe we'll even get to origami. Thanks. <sighs> See, I took everything out of my pockets because I was briefly thinking that I would describe how this is what's in my pockets every day. And I was out with someone. Uh, I think I knew a little girl. She was like, you have blah. I'm like, yeah. And I started pulling things out of my pocket. And there was no table or anything, so I just started hitting them to her because I had no place to hold them. And after a while, she's like, Why do you keep all this stuff in your pocket? And I'm like, Well, I might need it. I'm like, This is cute. This is more than I have in my purse. <laughs>